सोळा ते दोन हजार अठरा तो आयसर पुणे आणि त्रिवेंद्रम येथे तो प्रोजेक्ट वर काम करत होता प्रोजेक्ट असिस्टंट म्हणून आणि दोन हजार अठरा ऑगस्ट पासून तो सध्या टेक्सस मध्ये फायर इकॉलॉजी अँड सवाना कॉन्झर्वेशन लॅब डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इकोसिस्टीम सायन्स अँड मॅनेजमेंट टेक्सास ए अँड एम युनिव्हर्सिटी टेक्सास इथे तो पीएडी काम पूर्ण करतोय त्यांनी त्याच्याबरोबरच काही कोर्सेस पण केलेले आहेत वेगळे सध्या अमेरिकेत गेल्यानंतर त्यातले खूप पण खूप इंटरेस्टिंग कोर्स आहेत एक पहिला कोर्स त्यांनी केला आहे सर्टिफाईड इकॉलॉजिकल रिस्टोरेशन प्रॅक्टिशनर ट्रेनिंग बाय द सोसायटी ऑफ फॉर इकॉलॉजिकल रिस्टोरेशन युएसए हा एक कोर्स त्यांनी पूर्ण केला आहे ट्रेनिंग त्याच दुसरं त्यांनी सर्टिफिकेशन बाय नॅशनल वाईल्ड फायर कोऑर्डिनेटिंग ग्रुप युएस हा एक कोर्स केला आहे त्याच्यामध्ये त्याला त्याचं वेगळे स्पेशलायझेशन होते फायर फायटर ट्रेनिंग इंट्रोडक्शन टू वाईल्ड अँड फायर बिहेव्हिअर आणि तिसरं होतं ह्युमन फॅक्टर्स इन वाईल्ड अँड फायर सर्व्हिसेस त्यांनी मला खरंच म्हणजे कौतुक वाटतं त्याचं की म्हणजे कॉलेजच्या दुसऱ्या पहिल्या वर्षालाच असताना त्यांनी दोन त्याच्या नोट्स पब्लिश झालेल्या होत्या नॅचरल हिस्ट्री नोट्स त्याच्या पब्लिश झालेल्या होत्या दोन हजार बारा मध्ये बी एस सी फर्स्ट इयर करत असतानाच एक झू प्रिंट मध्ये झालेली होती आणि दुसरं हर्पेटॉलॉजी नोट्स मध्ये पब्लिश झालेली होती त्याचं सायंटिफिक पब्लिकेशन पहिलं दोन हजार चौदा मध्ये झालेलं आहे म्हणजे टीवाय बी एस सी करत असताना हा पण मला असं वाटतं एकदम वेगळा त्याचं हे आहे आणि आतापर्यंत त्याची सोळा पब्लिकेशन झालेली आहेत ती सुद्धा नॅशनल इंटरनॅशनल मध्ये विशेष म्हणजे एक त्याचं पब्लिकेशन करंट सायन्स मध्ये आहे तर नुकतंच त्याचं एक सायन्स आहे आंतरराष्ट्रीय जन्मदिन सुद्धा एक पब्लिश झालेला आहे त्याचं एक पुस्तक पब्लिश झालेलं आहे मागच्या वर्षीच ग्रासेस ऑफ बनी हे दोन भाषेमध्ये पब्लिश झालेलं आहे पुण्यातल्या बायफनी पब्लिश केलं आहे ते खरं तर फील्ड गाईड आहे त्याच्यामध्ये जवळजवळ चाळीस गवताच्या व्हरायटीज त्याच फील्ड गाईड त्या ओळखण्याचा आणि माहितीचा आहे आपल्या सगळ्यांना माहिती आहे बनी हा गुजरात मधल्या कच्छ भागातला एक ग्रासलँड प्रसिद्ध आहे त्याच्यानंतर त्याला अवॉर्ड खूप मिळालेले आहेत त्याचा मी काहीचा उल्लेख करतो इथे त्याला दोन हजार तेरा मध्ये डार्वी स्कॉलरशिप मिळालेली होती फॉर द अॅन्युअल बायोसिटी मॉनिटरिंग प्रोग्राम कंडक्टेड बाय फील्ड स्टडीज काउन्सिल श्रूबेरी युनायटेड युके नंतर त्याला दोन हजार अठरा मध्ये ही वॉज अवॉर्डेड मॅकमिलन वॉर्ड मेमोरियल ग्रॅज्युएट फेलोशिप फॉर कंडक्टिंग रिसर्च ऑन फॉरेस्ट इकॉलॉजी अँड मॅनेजमेंट इन ईस्ट टेक्सास आणि नंतर दोन हजार अठरा मध्येच त्याला त्याला ही वॉज अवॉर्डेड एक्सलन्स फेलोशिप बाय द कॉलेज ऑफ अॅग्रिकल्चर अँड लाईफ सायन्सेस टेक्सास ए अँड एम युनिव्हर्सिटी फॉर इज डॉक्टर रिसर्च म्हणजे मला असं वाटतं की इतक्या तो आपण हल्ली जसं वाटतं फोकस किंवा अत्यंत पहिल्यापासूनच त्यांनी ठरवलं दिसत होतं की आपल्याला ह्या फील्डमध्ये जायचं आहे आणि मी त्याला साधारणपणे दोन हजार सतरा पासून ओळखतो माझा परिचय त्याचा तेव्हा तो एम एस सी पार्ट टू करत होता आणि त्यावेळेला तो फर्युसन कॉलेज मधलं हार्बेरियम आणि फर्युसन कॉलेज मधलं बोटॅनिकल गार्डन ह्याच्यावरती त्याचं काही काम चालू होतं आणि त्याला त्यावेळेस रेफरन्सेस करता तो मला त्यांनी फोन केला होता माझ्या वडिलांनी काही काम जे केलं होतं त्याला बघायचं होतं म्हणून तो दोन हजार सतरा साली घरी आला आमच्याकडे आणि म्हणजे खरंच मी त्याला जे काय बघितलं कामाचं त्याचं जे सिन्सिरिटी कामाची तर कॉलेज संपल्यानंतर संध्याकाळी रोज तो जवळ संध्याकाळी साडेसहा सातला यायचा दीड दोन तास बसायचा आमच्या घरातल्या वडिलांचं जर मी त्याला सांगितलं व्हा इथे इथे आहे बघ मला काही माहित नाही त्यातलं कारण माझा विषय नाही आणि मग त्यांनी जे सगळं सॉर्टिंग करून त्याला वडिलांच्या काही नोटबुक काही म्हण मिळाली त्याच्यातनं त्याला काही त्यावेळेस वडिलांनी लिहिलेला पन्नास बावन्न सालातल्या काही नोट्स बोटॅनिकल गार्डन बद्दलच्या मिळाल्या आणि त्यांनी ते सगळं पब्लिश पण म्हणजे अत्यंत फोकस म्हणजे मला असं वाटतं की फार क्वचित मुलं अशी बघायला मिळतात की कॉलेजच्या पहिल्या वर्षापासून आपल्याला काही पुढे काम करायचं ठरवून कामाच्या दृष्टीने ते पुढे जात असतात तर तसं अशीच हे आहे आणि तो निश्चितच पुढे आपल्याला माहित ह्याच्यामध्ये खूप चांगलं करिअर करेल त्याला आपण सगळे शुभेच्छा देऊयात आणि त्याला मी आता विनंती करतो की त्याने आपलं भाषण सुरू करावं ओके थँक्यू सर ओके स्क्रीन विजिबल आहे सगळ्यांना हाय 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 ओके सो द टॉपिक विच आय एम गोन टू टॉक अबाउट टुडे इज शुड यू प्लांट ट्रीज ऑन द पुणे हिल्स एट ऑल सो ब्रॉडली what i'll be talking about is the history of the hills because without understanding how the hills were in history we cannot really understand what future or present interventions we should uh, undertake for management or conservation so we'll be spending 
an entire session dedicated to the history, the ecological history of the hills. Let's find out how the hills look like before time. And then um, we'll go to our motivations for planting trees. Why do we plant trees? And then try and see if our goals and our uh, actions align with each other. So Pune Hills are a savanna landscape even today. So you can see there are parts of the hills even today, which look like some, some, somewhat like this with open areas, scattered bush scrubby trees. Um, now, at least some of you might not have heard that there are savannas in India. So the term savannas has been historically uh, applied to ecosystems in the African plains where we see things on the television, which are largely flat open grazing lawns with wildebeest, uh, elephants, lions, stuff we see on Nat Geo and Discovery channels. But then does India have savannas too? And the answer is yes. Unfortunately, they've got misinterpreted as forests for a very long time. And it's only very recently in the last 10 years or so that people have started to publish about the fact that, oh no, these ecosystems in India are savannas too. So let's first try and understand what is the definition of a savanna. Uh, so in the left bottom panel over here, you can see areas. So there is a section of the panel, which is only grass without trees. So zero trees and only grass. So that is a grassland. It's pretty simple to understand. Then there is a section, uh, just next to it which my so which has a couple of trees and then still a lot of grass so that is an ecosystem with intermediate or low tree density and then still a scat uh, a continuous grassy layer so the definition of a savanna is as follows so it should first have a continuous grassy herbaceous layer uh, in the understory. So below the trees, you should, you should have continuous grasses. That's the key identifying feature. Second, the plants, all of which are found in those savannas have some of the other sort of adaptations for fires and regular megafaunal herbivory, which is grazing basically. So um, areas with these um, characteristics are termed as savannas. And then on your right hand side the panel on the right shows where are these places in india and you can see it's pretty much most of peninsular india so it's not like there are very few places in the country which match our, these definitions there are actually a lot of places right from pune to bangalore to the entire deccan plateau to some parts of gujarat all of this and this is just a prediction map of course there are savannas right in Rajasthan, in this part, there are also savannas in Uttarachal, Uttarakhand, the sub Himalayan ones. Those are the pine savannas which have been extensively published uh, about. So, uh, but this model, it's it, it's just a prediction model for the peninsular part of India. So, there are clearly savannas in other parts too. Even Corbett over here is a savanna, so it matches the definition of this. Uh, so, we'll take a look at some examples. So, part one is some part in Gujarat which has again this panel number one over here a continuous grassy layer and just one or two trees here and there which is pretty much the image which i showed you initially panel two on the other hand is from mudumalai national park uh, and you can see it's a pretty high tree cover it's almost uh, closing the canopy is almost closing but it's not a closed canopy forest so the key thing to notice is that you can still see a grassy layer below the trees, which indicates it's a savanna. Also, the trees have thick barks and all of the typical tree fire adaptation traits. Then the third example in the panel below is of Nagarjuna Sagar Sri Salem forest in Andhra Pradesh. And it is, uh, if you haven't been to that part, you can probably uh, take examples like Tadoba, Penj, Nagzira, Bandhavgarh, Kanha, all our major tiger reserves in central India uh, are clearly a savanna and they have been misinterpreted as a forest for a very, very, very long time. So this is essentially how ecologically savannas are defined. And this is a map where all savannas are present in India. So 
um, for a very long time, people thought that these savannas are a product of human deforestation. So there is a narrative of uh, there being a forest in the past and then uh, humans degrading it to form savannas. Uh, this is especially true with tropical savannas. So tropical savannas usually have a pretty high tree density compared to non-tropical areas, which are um, pretty different. And they have got really good recognition in terms of conservation. So for example, nobody in their right minds would question if the prairies in the, say, Texas or some parts of the US are man-made. Everybody knows they are, they're pretty ancient. There are multiple um, grasslands in Europe and e ecologists have recognized their antiquity, their biodiversity value since a very, very long time. But it is only in these tropical places that um, people have always questioned that are savannas man-made or are they natural? Um, and unfortunately, we have been relying upon pretty much outdated literature for classifying our savannas. So most of the parts in this image um, ecologists even today still carry on the colonial classification which is by champion and seth it it talks about the forest types of india and uh, believe me or not parts of the thar desert are classified as a forest it's classified as a thorn forest or scrub forest but it's still classified as a forest for some reason so this classification pre -colo uh, colonial classification uh, developed by British and German botanists was largely for timber production. And today, uh, fortunately, since we are independent, we clearly don't need to focus a classification system based on timber. So ecologically, it makes more sense to classify these places as savannas and grasslands instead of forests. So there has been a continuous debate of whether these tropical places are, are they man-made or are they natural? Have they been existing for a very, very long time, millions of years, or are they formed in the last thousand years or something like that? So this would primarily be the background for the initial section of the talk. We, we try and tackle and answer this problem of how old are the Pune Savannas? And remember, Pune Savannas are just a case study and uh, for Indian Savannas in general, because this narrative and this misapplied narrative rather and this framework has been rather applied to the entire country the savannas of the country and pune is just a data point in that um so the question we would try and answer is are the pune savannas created by humans by forest deforestation or are they really natural so here are the two hypotheses which we'd like to investigate. So if the Pune savannas are created by deforestation, if it is a yes, then here's what we are expected to find when we dig up data or look up, uh, find answers to our question. So if yes, then on the top panel, you can see that the his we would expect that the historical ecological state of such a place would be a closed canopy forest, which means Trees which largely do not allow sunlight to penetrate on the understory because of which you can see that there is no or minimal grassy layer in the understory of this historical state. And then over time with human uh, degradation, say cutting trees, burning frequently, we get this current state, which is the tree grass interaction uh, mixture. So histor if Pune savannas were actually formed after a conversion from a forest, then we would expect a forested state to be there in the past sometime back and which would have been replaced more recently by a savanna state, which is this one. But if not, which means if these savannas are actually ancient and not formed by degradation or defore deforestation, then we would expect that the historical state and the current state are the exact same thing. So we, so whatever you see today would be ecologically the same thing which you see back in time, no, no matter how long you go. So broadly, these are the two competing hypotheses which we would investigate. And 
these are the data sources which I'll be using to uh, investigate or try and find the answer to this. So here's again the map of savannas found in India and the, the everything shaded in blue is savannas in Africa and Asia. And you can see the African ones are pretty extensive. We all know them, but the Asian ones, including the Indian ones, have been recognized pretty recently. So that's the map. So the methods which we would use to try and answer if Pune savannas are ancient or man-made are first we would go into historical records. So historical records would be photographic records by early botanists. We would have paintings, we would have botanical illustrations, those kind of things. Um, but unfortunately, photography or painting, those records we just have till about 200 years or at the most 250 years before today. We can't really go back in time uh, using this data source. So historical records is one data source. Um, second data source, which I'll be using would be paleoecological reconstructions, which in simple terms is trying to understand uh, what kinds of fossil pollen grain were found in that place. So it's, you dig up a soil core in that area and then you take it out and then you can see what kinds of plants have grown there over time. The third data source, so source which will take us, so paleoecological data takes us back to about 4,000 years or something before today. But we want to actually go even uh, further back in time. So that's why we use something called as dated molecular phylogenies of certain plants and animals. So this is essentially molecular dating of these organisms, which we found we found, find today on these hills and then try and see what, what the habitat uh, was back in time. So this takes us back millions of years ago. And then the last data source, which I'm going to talk about is the presence of endemic biodiversity or what kind of biodiversity, biodiversity is there today and what can we infer from this biodiversity. So these are the data sources which we would use to um, try and answer the question. Okay, so this is an image which I've taken last year on the hills. And this is one part of the hill, which most of you might, might have probably seen. And this is a part where it's pretty much free of plantation. It's, it's not, uh, it's regularly burned. It's regularly grazed, but people haven't yet planted a lot of things. And it's pretty much uh, open as a landscape. So this is year zero. So on the bottom right side, you can see what uh, point in time we are talking about. So this is today. So this is the classic savanna landscape, which we just defined. So continuous grassy layer and scattered trees, native acacias and all those things. And then now what we are going to do is using those four data sources, we are going to go back in time and trying to see if there was a forest any time back. So here's our first data source, which is historical records. And um, this is an image of the exact same spot on the exact same hill, which shows the exact same ecological composition. So you do not see a forest here at all. You see uh, scattered trees and a lush, continuous, grassy, herbaceous understory. So again, this is 100 years before today and no forest 100 years uh, prior to 2020. Then let's go back uh, about 200 years in time and look at this wonderful painting created by a British historian, Edward Lear. And this shows if you guys probably are familiar with this part. So this is the Chatushrungi temple right over here. This is somewhere where the university should be current day. And this is the range hill, so university hills. And this part of the hills, which is in the foreground, is the Chatushrungi Hills range. So the SB road, today's SB road would be somewhere over here, right over here. So 200 years before today, you can see that the uplands, which is essentially the hills, they were still pretty open. The artist hasn't drawn a lush forest in that place. He clearly can draw trees, which he has drawn right in over here, but he hasn't drawn anything on these hills. In fact, what he has drawn, if you notice carefully on this 
left corner is thorny things and labeled them as a cactus. So um, it, it might not be ecologically accurate, but the message which we surely can take from this would be that the hills clearly weren't a forested place 200 years back. What was planted, so the trees which you see over here are clearly the ones which are planted by humans for different purposes. So you can see banyan trees with all the aerial roots, all those, all those things here. So clearly planted things down in the bottom lands, but clearly nothing on the hills. So that's 200 years before today. Oops. Now we go back to, we add 25 years to 200, it becomes 225 years before today. And this is the Parvati Hill in Pune. And this is another wonderful painting drawn by a artist named Gangaram Tambat, who was commissioned by the Peshwas to draw different landscapes in the Pune city. And then you can see here again, you have a brownish appearance of the entire thing. The artist can draw trees. It's not that he can't, but he hasn't. And what he has is drawn bigger things. And there is another image where um, you have more trees in the bottom lands where there's lots of settlement, but on the uplands on the hills, there's clearly an open area with hardly a couple of trees here and there. So again, till 225 years before today, there was still no forest. So now, unfortunately, these records just go to 200 years or something. So we need another data source to talk about things before 200 or 300 years. So what we do is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, try and check fossil pollen grains. So what was the composition of fossil pollen grains back in time on these places? So again, as I said, first of all, Pune Hills is just a case study in the larger landscape of Indian savannas. And this record, unfortunately, we do not have an exact same study for the Pune Hills, but this one is from the Lonar Crater in Central India, which biogeographically is very similar to what uh, the landscape which we are talking about. So here on the left in this panel, the Y axis, so the Y axis is million years before, I'm so sorry, thousands of years before today. So zero would be today, thousand over here would be thousand years before today, 4,000 years before today and 8,000 years before today. So as you go down this Y axis, the farther back in time you go, okay? And then what the authors have done is tried and classified all the types of pollen grains into different kinds of plant groups. So we'll just focus on two types. First would be the moist species, so which are in the first column, the dark green. The second would be the savanna species. Uh, and then the third would be the scrub species. So you can see that the scrub, the savanna species, you get a signature of the savanna species right up to 8,000 years before today. So this entire thing is with savannas. Um, if our hypothesis of a deforested origin was true, which means if uh, these savannas would have been created by forest deforestation, then we would expect to find savannas only after extensive human uh, use of this landscape, which is more or less after 4000 years in this upper panel. So we would expect to find a savanna signature largely in this part of the graph, but not here. And what we see here is in fact, it's a continuous thing. And in fact, it peaked somewhere around 9,000 years or something. So uh, agriculture started in this area, area as in Western central part of India. So again, this is pretty broad level analysis. So agriculture expansion with which there would have been an accompanied forest deforestation started only since 4,000 years in this part of the world. And then if we have savannas even before that, it clearly means they're not formed by human interventions. Um, and notice that the moist forest has been controlled in part also by rainfall. So the central panel over here shows, so you can ignore whatever's written in there. 
just look at the colors so red red shades mean drier parts in the climatic history blue shades means relatively wet parts in the climatic history so the wet parts correspond with the relatively high abundance of moist elements or moist uh, plants preferring moist environments the red parts color correspond well to the scrub elements uh, again it is important to note that um, it's not a stable thing over time so things even for forested ecosystems people have shown that uh, over time things have been dynamic and um, it's important to appreciate that uh, well on one hand there was by and large a savanna landscape before uh, 4000 years too but it is also important to understand that things have been pretty dynamic things have changed you've got some periods where you have a spike in the moist element you've got some periods where this uh, dip in the savanna elements so it's another thing also to understand that things can also pretty much be dynamic but in this case it is clearly not as dynamic or uh, it clearly hasn't shifted a state from a forest to an open land savanna landscape then um, we go to the last line of evidence which is molecular phylogeny dated molecular phylogeny so these are some beautiful creatures on the hills which are called fan-throated lizards or sitanas and um, if we try and see when did creatures which are found today creature endemic creatures like these which are found today when did these guys evolve what was the time period and that helps us to understand reconstruct what kind of environment uh, was there um, on these hills so this graphical representation here is about the diversification of this group uh, of lizards so one ancestor branches out into multiple ones and then it branches out more and then you get so many species which are listed over here and two of which are the underlined ones are found on the india uh, pune hills too so um, research now shows that this diversification or this evolution of multiple lineages corresponds well with the aridification across the world around 4 million years or 5 million years so the color change from green to yellow on this graph shows that um, there was a global aridification pattern uh, or a trend sometime that uh, in in that period so um, Clearly, the diversification and the evolution of these creatures have been has been shaped by the global aridification and the formation of savannas in not just India but multiple other parts of the world. So this was also the time around four million years ago when a lot of other uh, kinds of herbaceous plants and open landscape endemic species evolved across the world, not just India. So this takes us back to about 10 million years so this record shows us that how was the landscape broadly in terms of a open landscape or a forested landscape since 10 million years so and then you can see that clearly at least since 4 million years it was an open savanna because these are uh, organisms specifically adapted or endemic to open savanna landscapes and you would never find them in forested parts of the savanna or India. Another example of presence of species that diversified in response to aridification is this beautiful group of plants called Cyropagias. Um, they are still there on the hills, uh, also in places in other parts. And then this specific group of species, uh, people have recently shown that they've evolved again around four million years. A time which coincides really well with the global aridification in the four uh, Miocene, which is four million years. <coughs> Excuse me. And now the last line of evidence which we'll look at for understanding if Pune savannas are ancient or man-made is what kinds of things are present today. So the organisms which are found today the savanna endemic things which are something like this chlorophyte baruchi this endemic c4 grass lophopogon tribe dentatus this plant called jatropha nana which is vulnerable uh, 
lacerated skinks, which are also endangered, and the sitana. These are all endemic organisms, which are found exclusively on those areas. So if there were no endemics, we would clearly be suspicious about the origin of these places. But the fact that we have species restricted to uh, the savannas or open landscapes clearly means that they have had a long period of time to evolve in this landscape. So if it was a landscape formed after forest degradation, you would expect largely generalist species as opposed to specialist species, which are these ones. So, and these plants also bear, plants and animals bear specific adaptations to, um, sus to uh, be, to manage or to survive regular above ground disturbances like fire and grazing. So tuberous roots are one adaptation which we'll be talk about, talking about later on. Um, there are also studies now in the world which show that some grasses, they flower only after they've been burned. So the importance of fires is now well known in these landscapes, both for uh, the phenology or the flowering fruitings of the plant and also for the long term persistence and actually maintenance of this biodiversity. So these four data sources uh, support the antiquity of our savannas, which means they are uh, clearly ancient. So there is no data source which would tell you that there was a forest sometime back in time, at least till four million years ago. Um, people have imagined such ecological histories in multiple parts of the world and for multiple ecosystems too. For taking an example from Africa, there was there's this wonderful book which talks about how um, some how researchers actually uh, misinterpreted some parts of villages in Africa, which they thought the forest, the treed regions in those villages were remnants and everything else was degraded, but it turned out to be the other way around, where, which was people actually planted those trees and the historical state was a treeless, largely open landscape. So people have had this um, imagined ecological histories for many parts of the world, including classic studies like Africa, places like Africa. And also to give an example closer to our home would be some parts of Western Ghat. So um, this is a mission Devrai program. So Devrai's, um, there's been a narrative of Devrai's being really, really ancient, really, really representative of whatever historical uh, composition there was. But there has been some research which shows that no, that might not really be the case. They might not be a reference ecosystem. They might actually be created by people who, um, pretty recently in like the last thousand years or something less than that. So um, people have had this habit of imagining ecological histories without a strong empirical uh, database for a variety of ecosystems in the world and for a lot of uh, in Indian ecosystems as well. So today, so to answer our initial questions, question, which was, are these uh, Pune savannas a product of human degradation? But the answer is clearly no. So at least since 4 million years, we've got a savanna configuration and which has been maintained by regular fires and grazing, which, and uh, has been maintained in this savanna configuration, configuration, which we see today. So no matter how far back in time you go, you will not find a forested counterpart, which got converted after human degradation. Uh, we'll talk about fires uh, in the later part of the talk, but largely this is a very important background to try and go for answering the questions about land management, which is about planting trees. So to summarize this section, savannas like forests can also be ancient. So this is not to say that everything, every inch of land which you see in every part of that savanna is ancient. There are clearly some parts which are formed after you've done agriculture, but this is talking in general about the landscape. 
So for example, in this image, you might have some portions right over here, which was an agricultural field, maybe 20 years back. And now this is technically a grassland. But what this argument is about is the larger landscape. It's not about specific parcels of land. So savannas like forests can also be ancient and therefore Pune savannas are all clearly ancient as we saw and not human created. With this, we uh, come to the second section of um, the talk, which is why do we plant trees? This is in general. So what are our motivations for planting trees? And then if you ask around people, you read stuff, you would try and understand, you would uh, come to realize that there are largely four major uh, motivations of why people plant tree trees. First usually is to restore the habitat. We want to restore something which is missing. So that's a valid motivation. Second is increasing the biodiversity. So the assumption is the place where we are restoring is a degraded place and therefore we need to add on biodiversity and therefore we plant trees. So that's another motivation. The third motivation is carbon. We plant trees because we want to sequester more carbon. Uh, carbon capturing is important, so we plant trees. And the last motivation is planting trees uh, improves groundwater levels. So water is important for all of us and we should plant trees because it improves groundwater tables or in general water infiltration. So these are the four motivations. What we're going to do is one by one check how uh, valid they are in terms of the Pune Hills and uh, the background which we saw in the earlier part. So first is the restoration motivation. For any restoration program or a project, an important thing is to have restoration targets. So you, whenever you go about restoring a piece of land, the question which you should ask is, what is my target ecosystem, which I'm going to try and um, uh, achieve my uh, achieve my uh, levels too. So uh, understanding the targets ecosystem and defining a specific reference and target ecosystem is very important because we need to know what direction to head to, right? If we are like, okay, we'll just do some intervention. Let's see how things work out. That's just uh, trying out um, different strategies without an end. So we need to have like a specific end point, a specific goal, a specific reference ecosystem. For the Pune Hills, um, the reference ecosystem which all of us have in our minds is that there was a forest ecosystem which was the reference historical ecosystem. And from the data we saw, it clearly doesn't seem to be like that. The forests are only in our mind. Uh, they clearly don't exist uh, at least since 4 million years. And trying to define them as restoration targets or reference ecosystems is inaccurate in terms of ecological um, uh, methods. So we actually miss the targets when we talk about tree plantation for restoration purposes. So if there was no forest, at least since 4 million years, why are we restoring the hills to forest? So it's a valid question to ask. If since 4 million years, if things were as they are today, which we can see in these two things, um, what, there's clearly no need to add more trees. And in fact, what you probably need is to cut down some of them. So um, a lot of research on grasslands and savannas uh, in the last decade has shown very clearly that in order to restore grasslands and savannas, you actually need to cut down trees and burn the place frequently. So um, it's been shown for a very large set of global grasslands and the key threat to global grasslands and savannas is adding more trees rather than trees disappearing from them. So which is a pretty much counterintuitive idea. We're not used to this, but it's, 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 it's pretty much an established narrative now in the recent decades in ecology. So, <coughs> excuse me, there is this um, important difference between afforestation and reforestation. So when we talk about 
reforestation it means there was a forest before and we are trying to replicate a forest again so that's the re but what we are doing as you can see in this image on the pashan hills is actually a forestation which is adding trees in places where they were not present historically in clearly densities which are far greater than the historical ones anyways so um there's a difference between these two things and there are very very few excellent examples of tree plantations as restoration measures in india especially in the western ghats which are truly restoration uh, measures so programs by ncf in parts of western ghats and the northeast are excellent examples of how trees can be used for restoration but for most of our savanna regions which was a huge chunk of our country as i showed you in the map tree plantations are probably a really really bad thing to do not just ecologically also socio ecologically so there has been a lot of research uh, especially in india which shows how um planting trees on village lands public commons has been actually disadvantageous to the local communities and eventually ending up being no good for ecology as well so that's something to think about so the second motivation why we plant trees is to increase native biodiversity there is a notion that adding trees would result to increased biodiversity but unfortunately this is not true in places like these so this is the same image or the same slide which we saw earlier these are the endemic things which were found on the hills and there is increasing amount of data to show that planting trees of any sort i stress this planting the native west of the native tree you can think about would hamper not just these things but a whole of other creatures too so it is important to understand that adding trees artificially might not be a good idea for these landscapes and um it actually reduces biodiversity so that's our motivation number 2 and these are some articles which i these are some pretty old ones this is in 2015 2016 so uh there has been so this these are local ones this was in type the times of india pune mirror talking about how plantations are actually hampering uh, endemics but this is <clears throat> a recent thing which we got out in science so it was a rebuttal or a comment against a group which uh, advocated planting a trillion trees to halt climate change so uh, another motivation which i haven't explicitly stated is uh, to halt climate change and then now data shows that adding trillion trees or no matter what uh, number you say would actually is not actually the most nature effective or the natural nature based solution for halting climate change so it's actually pretty disastrous in many ways so that's our motivation number 2 crossed out the third motivation is okay tree store carbon we want to increase the carbon storage we want to reduce atmospheric co2 capture it and sequester it so which is a great thing trees do store carbon um one thing which we forget unfortunately in this and this is the mistake which a lot of ecologists do till date today is that we focus on the stuff which is above ground only so stuff which we can see with our naked eyes so here's a tree and you can see that most of its biomass is above ground so 71% of biomass which is storing your carbon 71% is above ground so your idea that trees store carbon is perfect cool and they store a relatively small percentage of biomass below ground which is 29% in this case what we frequently miss and what data now shows extensively is grasses so your the example is for grasses but it it also applies to the larger group of grasses forbs shrubs and savanna or grassland restricted species 
they have only a minor portion of their biomass above ground and a major portion below ground. So data now shows that a few clumps of trees and probably an half an acre of a savanna can store equivalent amounts of carbon if you do a total of the above ground and below ground thing. So uh, it's not a one is to one comparison, but grasslands store a huge deal of carbon below ground and it remains underappreciated, especially by ecologists and then consequently by policy makers and people like us who go plant trees with a very good intention that they might be good for carbon storage. But in the process, what we do while we dig even a small one by one meter pit is we destroy the below ground biomass of grasses and forbs, which actually store a pretty high amount of biomass in the soil. So that's our motivation number three question. And then the last motivation which we have is adding trees increases groundwater. So the tree water relation. So this has been a very uh, heavily researched and heavily debated thing in the ecohydrology world. So does more tree, trees mean more water? And the answer is not always. It, the answer is not a yes, the answer is not a no. The answer is not always. It depends on the ecosystem. It depends on what um, level you're looking at. It depends on what plant species you're looking at. It depends on habitat, so all of that. So just to give you an example, this is a study from Argentina, an Argentinian grassland. And it's a tropical thing too. So it's, it's, it's not something which we can't relate to. And this show on this left panel, it is the groundwater level over time compared to um, an area which was afforested. So same case like ours, which is adding trees, which were historically not there. Natives, uh, in this case, I think the, the non-natives too, but in general, adding trees in landscapes, which they're not found historically. So the trends of groundwater level over time is highlighted in this graph on the left, which shows that the grasslands, which is the gray line, show a significantly high amount of groundwater level compared to the forest, which is the black line on the graph. So there's a clear difference in the groundwater levels uh, in those two habitat types. And then the mechanism which they propose is this. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but these are the trees added in the grassland. This is the original grassland. And what happens is one must remember that trees also suck up water. Trees, we very frequently forget that trees transpire water off and water also evaporates. So ET or evapotranspiration is a mechanism which reduces the groundwater table too. So um, that's something which we very frequently forget that the vertical movement of water is also an important component. And what happens in this process in their study, they've realized is actually it creates more saline soils and uh, reduces the groundwater table. So they'd also talk about how adding trees creates more salinity in the soil and also reduces the groundwater table by a lot. So that's our motivation number four question. So let's go back to why do we plant trees again? So we had one, two, three, four things. And then we have systematically looked at restoration. We are getting our reference or the target ecosystems wrong. So clearly there's no need to plant trees because there were no trees. The forests existed only in our minds. They were never there. No data shows that there's a forest. Um, second was increasing biodiversity. Well, no, it actually decreases a lot of biodiversity. Third is carbon. It uh, destroys below ground bud banks, below ground storage organs of a lot of grassland and savanna plants. And clearly it's reducing carbon. And lastly, water. Then clearly it's a very complex issue and it is naive or I would say it is, um, it's not useful to understand that it's, it's, it's wrong to understand actually and inaccurate to say that adding more trees would just lead to more groundwater. So that's about should you plant trees on the Pune Hills. I, I try and specifically make this distinction. This is about the areas which are not planted yet. Whatever is left, whatever I showed you in the images. It doesn't talk about our backyards. It doesn't talk about 
um, the roadsides. It doesn't talk about artificial places which we have in the city. So uh, if I want an exotic ornamental tree in my backyard, it is perfectly fine to have it. Uh, this argument is about relatively um, wild landscapes or urban wild places which are left and not about the built up area in the city. So now um, this is in a way very pessimistic. So what should we do? What's the way forward? So try and understand that um, savannas and grasslands have these habitats have been a part of our culture since a very long time and we have for some reason conveniently forgotten completely about it so um, when we talk about anjan kanchan karvandi cha kateri desha we somehow forget the word kateri completely because it it doesn't appeal to us so there this is just a small example but you have countless uh, cultural references which clearly show a savanna or open landscape. We have a lot of uh, specific communities like the Dhangars, which have been dependent on these savannas and grasslands for a very, very long time. But uh, we do not appreciate this at all. And I would say if there is something unique about Pune Hills, it is a thorny brown biodiverse place. And that is a unique thing. It is, uh, it is, a ma it's not something to be proud of that we have, we probably would create a mango orchard on our hills, even if mango is native. So um, appreciating what we have is really the way forward is what I think. And ap also appreciating the roles of fires. Um, every year the hills are on fire. People deliberately set, set it on fire and not all of that is bad. We'll talk about it soon. So um, trying to understand that these landscapes have been having fire since a very, very, very long time before humans evolved and also after humans evolved. And then most of these are human set fires and they're not really bad. So now we come to the last part of the talk, which is I'll just quickly talk about fires in this landscape, but this fire ecology for these landscapes would be an entire different thing to talk about. So I'll just quickly cover it and talk about how fires are linked with endemic biodiversity. So this uh, image on the lower panel shows how things work on our hills too. So you have got these grassland plants, these forbs and grasses, there's a fire. After the fire, the above ground things die off. And then you see that there, there are these below ground roots and tubers. And then they re-sprout in the growing season, like say in our case, the monsoon season. After they re-sprout, they flower. And a lot of data now shows that many of these species flower profusely or significantly greater when they're burnt if they're, as compared to when they're not burnt. And clearly more flowers would mean more chances of survival through seed production. So fires shape it in that sense. So, and then they produce fruits, <coughs> excuse me, and then, um, everything else stays dormant below ground till the next fire. So fires kill off everything above ground, but things remain intact below ground and soil is a wonderful insulator. And what happens is these regular surface fires are actually necessary for the persistence of these endemic plants. So Jetropha nana, you can see the tuberous thing on the upper panel, which you can relate to this plant. Then. So fires are not always bad. Um, they have been happening for a very long time, either human ignited or through lightning initially. And in our lab, for example, we do prescribe burns. So um, vandalism is one thing, setting things on fire without ensuring security of things, without having the necessary safety precautions is a different thing. But having set fires with a very, very, uh, objective management goal is something which a lot of uh, people do in many parts of the world. So for India, we have really good data for the Soliga tribes in Karnataka in the BRT hills, which they have been setting fires in their land for a very long period of time. And then with um, the emergence of modern conservation practices or when we created our national parks or sanctuaries when BRT got converted into a tiger reserve 
our colonial um, forest system, threw them out of the sanctuary, saying that these guys, they burn our forest, this is bad, we shouldn't do this. And what happened is, there was a great deal of invasion of this exotic plant called lantana. Um, and now, the forest department spends crores of rupees mechanically managing that thing, which technically the Soligas used to do for free. And they had actually a nuanced understanding of, oh, what kind of fire is necessary? What do we need to manage lantana? And socio-ecological research has now shown that working with local communities is actually the way forward for conservation and not working by excluding them. So fires also intricately link with the socio, ecological and economic domain uh, as it links with the ecological part. So I'd like to acknowledge Yale Center and the Houghton Library for the images, the historical images. Uh, this is some old thing which I'd done. So Idea Wild had funded me, funded me during 2015 and my friend and Vartak sir for his support. So thank you. And this is my email ID and my research website. So if you've got uh, questions which we can probably talk on later on, uh, then feel free to mail me or uh, feel free to stop by the website. And I'm happy to take questions right now too. I'll request everybody to ask the questions in a chat session and they can be replied. If they are more detailed, then please email. Whatever the debatable points are there or debatable chats are there that I'm not taking at the moment. There is a question by uh, Abhijit sir. Would forest like areas are seen 20 kilometers of aerial distance from Pune on 60 kilometer aerial distance. Mm -hmm. uh, great hornbills are found, which are mm -hmm. specialist species and only right. found in thick forests. Right. Yeah. So about that, clearly. So if you go to Tamhini, if you go to the Ghats, which are a very short distance from Pune, that is a forest ecosystem. Lonavala, Amboli, Tamini, all those parts, those are a forest. You do not see a continuous grassy understory. You see closed canopy, evergreen trees, that's a forest. So uh, it's important to delimit things really well. So you're right. So that's a forest ecosystem and clearly those are special species. And uh, please put up your last slide wherein your email ah. ID is okay. so that everybody can uh, just a sec. Or you can just. Thank you. Okay. Uh... So there's a you question okay, about. Uh, just a sec. I'll open the chat. Just a sec. Yeah, I think I can't open the chat without not yeah. sharing the screen. Yeah. I, so, I'll, okay. I'll read out the chat session no, questions. Now I can you... see it. I think I'll, you... I'll read them. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there's a question about um, Lonar and Pune. So the thing is, when we're comparing about landscapes in general, this was about the biogeographic comparison and would not be specifically about location. So again, initially, what the, uh, I had this disclaimer initially that Pune is just a case study and it represents literally everything for our savanna landscapes in the Indian region. So uh, these are places which have formed pretty much the same time in the geological history and therefore we it, they're pretty much comparable. So this is not to imply that if you go today to that place, and if you go today to Pune Hills, you'll find exactly the same species. This is implying that you'll have functionally same ecosystems. The species might be different. So uh, dichrostatches, acacias, these are thorn forests, but uh, the important thing is to understand that the word forest means managing them as a forest. 
which means stopping fires, which means stopping grazing. And uh, that's what should be done in most of our forest, real forest ecosystems, which are the Western Ghat, uh, largely the Western Ghat ones. But once you name something a forest, you not only misclassify it, but also misclassify it based on our uh, laws and regulation. For example, a classic example of this would be today setting fires in any Indian forest is a crime by the Indian Forest, uh, the Wildlife Act, which is really, really sad because it not only prevents fire ecology research, but also criminalizes the huge set of locals who regularly burn their land for subsistence practices. So it is time that our colonial era policies are actually combined with much more uh, recent research and largely research on people too, because that's what uh, is missing. So we usually ignore people and that should be there in the picture when it's about conservation. So that's one thing. I'll just write my email ID over here too. So people have it. So what's your view on seed dispersal of native plants found and let nature take a call? So, um, no, I would, I, I, um, it depends again on what's your management goal. What's your management goal for whatever particular piece of land you have. If, if, um, you, there are a lot of studies, as you rightly say, people do add seeds, even like for grasses and the smaller things, people do add seeds and have seed addition experiments. But unfortunately, what a huge deal of studies across the United States, across Europe, across tropics, in also some parts of India have shown that adding seeds for grassland restoration increases whatever uh, of groups you want, right? So it's essentially gardening. You're just planting whatever you want. That's good. That would be good if after a particular point in time, that species richness and the diversity would be sustained but what happens is you need to keep on adding things over and over and the local extinct extinction in these areas actually uh, uh, reduces the diversity again and again. So adding seeds is something for the grassland species is something we need to extensively test more in India, but it's largely being seen unsuccessful as of now. Uh, next question is in just a second okay so there's a question on what do you mean by fine leaved and broad leaf so this is a, a functional classification of the savannas so the savannas which are uh, acacia savannas these are fine leaved trees therefore the savannas are bio they, they are functionally classified into fine leaved savannas and then um, the broad leafed ones are something like the teak ones in the central India or those kinds of ones. So that's the fine versus broad leafed classification, which recently people have proposed. And it is a very ecologically meaningful thing as compared to saying a dry deciduous forest, a mice deciduous forest, a thorny forest, a scrub forest. Uh, uh, by and large, what ecologists now think is we should clearly abandon a forest based classification because hey, a huge part of India is not a forest, then why do we still call a forest? Why why are Pune Hills called a forest? I see no um, memesalons. I see no uh, evergreen species. I see no, I, I actually see grassy understory. So it is ecologically a savanna. So I should call it a savanna, right? Because it implies how we manage it. Uh, okay, seed addition thing we talked about. Okay, so uh, I would say that this is not a contradictory viewpoint as such. Uh, this is a body of research which has been building up in the last 10, 20 years. My work has been restricted to say, Jatrofanana, its ecology, its pests and all other things. Uh, so I've worked, my thing is just one tenth of this entire thing. All other things which I'm conveying in this thing are already done by other people in amazing journals and 
it's something which ecologists have come to realize very recently that um, the outdated model of succession that, oh, grasslands are just a succession stage of a forest. You give it enough time, it becomes a forest. The diagram which all ecology textbooks have needs actually to be taken down. So there, there's a re there's recent research which shows that this is completely wrong. We need to move away. So I'm just conveying all of this. Um, and then there's a question about fire. So when fire is man-made, why are we advocating it? Let nature set fires if it needs to, isn't it? It's right. Uh, but unfortunately, what has happened is um, initially, so before humans were setting fires, it used to largely be, these are all the records which show clearly that it used to be lightning ignited. The ignition source for fires used to be lightning before humans started igniting them. And then of course, human took over uh we started igniting fires and unfortunately we also cut down landscape connectivity because of which things became fragments and then even if there's lightning ignited fires they won't spread and then therefore there's fire suppression and what happens is um it's not saying that what taking humans out of the box and saying they are not part of nature this talk or ecological research advocates having humans in the box and saying that humans have served as a surrogate for the frequent fires which were happening even before humans came. So there are um, actually books written about fire ecology in India and this is, scary, uh, this is sad. So there's this book called World Fire, which I have, and it has a chapter on Indian fire culture. It has a chapter on how Nataraja having his um, fire dance is actually a central thing. And, what has happened is we've forgotten the role of Nataraja, both in our culture as well as our ecology. So we, the fires today, all we have is the ones which you see in your temples, that's it. And we hardly have them on ground. And what globally people are worry, worrying, ecologists are worrying, is the lessening of fire than the additions or like uh, increasing fires. So this is a very coarse argument which I'm putting it right now, but um to answer your question human ignited fires in some senses serve as a surrogate for what was happening pre-humans so the grass which is being burnt doesn't really care if lightning burns it or i burn it with a matchstick um, so that's the argument so that's why people use it as a regular management tool in many parts of the world so as i told you we do a lot of prescribed fires there's actually a very scientific method to go about that um, a lot of our locals, a lot of Dhangars burn the land, but uh, remember how you look at people who burn uh, forests or who burn savannas, it's actually seen very um, in a very criminal lens, which we need to stop. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, a forest manager has a Again, so these are two different skill sets. Ecologists do not have the managerial knowledge to manage a forest. Managers have that ground knowledge, which is super important. There's no denial of the fact that forest managers are less important. Although there is a very clear suggestion that our management activities should be driven by science whenever. Uh, so this is this doesn't really just apply to ecology. I think it applies to everything. So whenever we do any intervention or any restoration activity or any management activity or like let's say even if i'm going to do something just in my backyard the only question i should ask is is this activity supported by science and if the answer is yes we should definitely carry on but if the answer is no then that just clearly becomes a subjective view and it is important to understand that ecology as a science just like any other science is very dynamic. What we have in our textbooks, as I told you, the succession model, which is very famous, all schools or all colleges teachers, even today, is pretty outdated. It, it, and that it, it's shown to be for outdated for a very long time. And um, that's the only argument that science should actually be uh, driven to management.
right so uh, there's a question about um socially constructed nature which is very important so uh, the i couldn't go into the nuances of this but i wanted to um so in many parts people have shown that things are dynamic um like that there are there are there are papers on the vijayanagara empire in southern india which show that how there was a resurgence of forests some in some in in some parts of history there was uh, absolutely less trees in some parts of history then they appeared again so things have been pretty much dynamic and all of this has been asserted ascertain to people and people the role of the local economy and all of this uh but having set this stage first that hey savannas can also be ancient is an important stage i think to then go into the nuance that okay and then people are also an intricate part of this just I, like for what i talked about for the fires so um, i think that's a very valid point okay so which plants do you recommend to plant on the road sides uh again i no. contrary to what people would think i would again say what do you want on your road sides so research shows um neighborhood plant composition so this is about the built up area this would show um whatever you you have your preferences you get that composition over time so if you prefer showy flowers have a gulmohar that's perfectly fine it's it's not an invasive thing it's an exotic thing but if you want the native thing the native thing is a thorny acacia with a lot of grassy layers and it is simply not a uh, logical to have that kind of landscape on road sides because your management goal now is shade provisioning your management management goal is now aesthetics and these motivations driving tree plantations uh result in a different set of communities so go plant whatever you like is best for your road so it's it's up to you as long as it's 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 at least not invasive that's preferred but i i wouldn't even argue for going for native trees because you know what coconut is technically a native plant but it wasn't historically found on pune hills so it's not indigenous per se but i would like a coconut tree in my backyard because it has it, it's a provisioning system which is provided to me i like mango trees they give me fruits so that's perfectly fine the whole important thing is uh to actually understand our management goal and to see how we actually meet them yes thank you thank you very much cooper uh, sundar lecture zala thank mm-hmm. you ashish sir Welcome. for a wonderful lecture it's a very thought provoking and mm-hmm. uh, we are really grateful for a different insight into these relevant questions which are bothering every uh, nature lover thank you mm-hmm. welcome and uh, i'll circulate your email to if <laughs> anybody has any query they can uh, direct it to ashish sir or they can direct it to mission devrai we can help you correct ashish sir ajit oh oh uh आशीष फार सुंदर झालं प्रेझेंटेशन आणि माहितीचं पण खूप छान दिलं त्यामुळे लोकांना अनेक प्रश्न असणार आहेत तर त्याच्यामुळे ते तुला नक्कीच ह्याच्यावरती हे करतील कॉन्टॅक्ट करतील पुढच्या शनिवारी म्हणजे अकरा जुलैला आपण संध्याकाळी परत सहा वाजताच आपण भेटणार आहोत आणि त्या दिवशी आपण एक वेगळंच करिअर निवडणारा किंवा वेगळ्याच वाटाने गेलेला एका तरुणाची मुलाखत आपण ठेवलेली आहे त्याचं नाव आहे चेतन शेडजाळे हा सोलापूरचा आहे आणि त्याने ग्रॅज्युएशन शिवाजी विद्यापीठातून आर्किटेक्चरची पदवी घेतल्यानंतर इटालीतून मास्टर इन कार अँड ट्रान्सपोर्टेशन डिझाईनचं कोर्स पूर्ण केला त्याच्यानंतर तो अनेक आंतरराष्ट्रीय कंपन्यांमध्ये त्यांनी नोकरी केलेली आहे आणि सध्या अमेरिकेतील जगप्रसिद्ध हार्ले डेव्हिडसन मोटर कंपनीमध्ये सिनियर इंडस्ट्रियल डिझायनर म्हणून तो काम करतोय तर त्याची आपण मुलाखत ठेवलेली आहे की त्यांनी असं वेगळं करिअर कसं निवडलं आणि आपल्या महाराष्ट्र त्याचं म्हणणं की मुलं या विषयात जात नाहीत पुढं तर त्याच्यामुळे 
तर ते विषय कस आपण निवडले पाहिजे वेगवेगळे विषय आपल्याला माहितीये का आपण फक्त डॉक्टर इंजिनियर किंवा हेच आपल्या मुलांनी ध्येय असतं पण ह्या मुलांनी एकदम पूर्णपणे वेगळा विषय घेऊन आणि आता त्यांनी खूपच जागतिक कीर्तीवर गेले पाच वर्ष तो अमेरिकेतलं टॉप डिझायनर म्हणून त्याला अवॉर्ड पण मिळत आहे आणि त्याची मुलाखत आपण ठेवलेली आहे पुढल्या शनिवारी संध्याकाळी सहा वाजता there is a pers- going to be a personal request i'll uh, we all are uh, thinking uh, the time to time the, uh, the devrai when uh, how we can uh, identify when it was established and you are these methodologies will help us in identifying the age of a sacred grove so if any research has been done on those lines please uh, let me know uh, and in- so i what think can we about the person who has done some good deal of research on the age of devrais which actually um, they have um, a paper which has the same paleo ecological data which i showed you for lonar lake for some uh, karnataka devrais is shonil bhagwat so he he has done good deal of paleo fossil data so you'll get to know exactly the age of at least some of your the karnataka devrais again we don't have data for all devrais throughout because it's a costly thing to do so what whatever thing we have right now it just shows that things can also be recent so i think one of his papers in the kodagu area they mentioned that they found that these were actually formed by people not really remnant very recent like 500 or 800 years before today which is striking because you would imagine these things are there since millions of years and then when your data shows that no these are pretty recent we have this oh this is now secondary so they should be viewed in a different way which is also wrong i mean people argue that you viewing secondary landscapes as something degraded is actually wrong so i think it well, can help you more ashish aaj aapko tum ullekh karta jo kelas na shonil bhagwat ha ha aaj aapla yacha mala join lalela hai ha right me tanche कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट समथिंग for this lecture if, if there is any difficulty in contributions you can contact dr ajit vartak sir or you can email to mission devrai at gmail.com and we can help you you can uh, send check you can uh, deposit the cash or check in any branch of bank of maharashtra they have a core banking facility so you can deposit in any branch anywhere and if there is any difficulty do contact mission devrai at gmail.com we'll be very happy to help you and uh, get connected thank you i think we had a very wonderful uh, lecture and uh, we will be putting up on youtube after editing it and uh, deleting whatever the other the then lecture the question answers may be so uh, and thank you everybody now i'll close the meeting and thank you ashish sir for a wonderful thank lecture thank you we are grateful thank you Thanks. i'm closing the meeting now yes. thank you